right. Thank you all for coming. Um, this is going to be a little bit weird for me when I teach. I'm used to moving around and flailing, so this is going to be weird kind of staying in one spot. <clears throat> but before I get started, I did want to say thank you to Marineland for allowing me to come in and talk to you guys. Uh, and the GTM, uh, I just realized as Kenneth and Taryn were doing their introductions, when I was making this, I was so concerned and consumed about putting cool fish pictures in this, I forgot to put Flagler College logo and the GTM <laughs> logo. So I do want to thank them. Without the GTM, they've been an amazing, amazing, amazing partner for Flagler College and for our students, and they basically are making this research possible for us. So the talk I'm going to give today, um, I was trying to think of a good title for this, right? When people hear I do fish research, usually the first question is, you know, where can I catch good fish? So I'm just going to get this out of the way. I am awful at fishing. I can tell you what they eat, where they live, how long they live, all this stuff about them, but not what to do to get them to bite. So the fish I tend to work with are smaller fish. Um, that's why I have conservation comes in all sizes. What we tend to look at is what I call the near shore community. So these are smaller fish that live near kind of the, uh, the easy access points for us. Get this to work. And then I hit, there we go. I'll get it to work, there we go. All right, so Kenneth did give a, my background. This picture here is from Mongolia when we were there. My advisor, one day I came in, asked him a question about my PhD research and he kind of ignored my question and said, you wanna to go to Mongolia? I kind of forgot my question after that point, but it was a really amazing opportunity. It was right after I finished my PhD. Um, I now joke with my wife that I can call myself an international researcher because I've been to Mongolia and two or three people there know who I am. Um, but it really gave me kind of a good opportunity to see what research is like in other areas. So I've done freshwater research with small stream fish and headwater streams, streams that you basically can step across. I've done work with striped bass in the Chesapeake, so a much bigger system, saltwater and freshwater influenced, and then working with salmon, freshwater salmon in Mongolia. So. Through all of this, it's basically reinforced my love of kind of doing what I do. So, there we go. I apologize, I will get this to work. Maybe I'll just point at Kenneth to do this. So, I graduated in 2012 after I got back from Mongolia. I started here at Flagler College. The picture there, some of you folks might recognize, that's Matt Kimball. He was the former research director. Nikki Dix is the current research director. So when I got here, I knew nothing about Florida. I grew up in Pennsylvania. We didn't have an ocean right near us. We didn't have intercoastal waterways. So he was nice, nice enough to kind of let me tag along and see what stuff they were doing at that time. On the left of Matt Kimball, there's Tom Harding, someone who was, who was employed by the, the GTM. So we were going out and doing trawl surveys. So behind the boat, we're dragging a net looking at what fish are there. It was an amazing experience kind of gave me a taste of what's here. Because when I got here, I was told by the college, you need to do research. I had never had to come up with my own research agenda in the past. I basically stepped into projects. They kind of told me what to do. I put my own spin on it and we were good to go. So I came in not knowing what I wanted to do. And these, these folks at the NUR, uh, continuing to this day, have been really helpful in kind of directing us, letting us know what their needs are and letting us kind of fill in. So starting in 2012, I started to try to formulate a research project. What's really nice is the GTM has a boat, we don't. So it was kind of difficult at first to do this without a boat. Um, so what we did is we had to come up with ideas that were cheap and we could easily do, right? Yeah, I'm just gonna point it, I'm just gonna put that down. So when we went, um, the first thing I noticed was this is an incredibly diverse system. So upper left, we have lane snapper. Upper right is a leopard sea robin. Bottom left is a striped burfish. Bottom right is a bonnethead shark. So these are just a few of the things we caught. And what I learned in top talking to folks here was there's over 300 species of fish. Just a massive amount of diversity. Now, not all of them live in here at all times. Sometimes they are marine transients, they come in once in a while, some come in to breed, some are permanent residents. So it occurred to me at first that if I'm gonna do fish research, I better learn what fish are here. So what I had to do next was I had to see uh, what resource was there. 
So this book here is a book I have in my office. It's the site profile of the GTM NER. Luckily, someone had gone through a consulting firm and kind of figured out what fish were here. So I looked at this list and said, I don't know what any of those things are. So the circles are things that I went, found pictures, found out about the life history, and I did this. I made a PowerPoint for basically all 300 species that were here. So I realized when I started that I had to learn what was here before I started. So that was kind of the first spot. Some of these are easy to pick out. Some of these are really hard to pick out. Some I still can't pick out because it's really hard to do in the field. So with that in mind, I realized that you know, there, there are certain things we can do without a boat. And one of the things that kept coming up was climate change. Climate change is a big issue. Sea level rise is a big issue. What we're finding out in this area is we're at a very interesting kind of area where mangroves are starting to move their way north and intermix with the salt marsh. The picture you see there is a black mangrove. There's different communities associated with the different vegetation. You'll get certain fish with salt marsh. You might get certain communities with mangroves. So one of the things we wanted to kind of figure out was, well, if mangroves are moving in and replacing the vegetation we have, what's going to happen to the fish species? So the kind of the first thing was when we need to figure out, you know, we have that list of things that are here and studies have been done. They're kind of few and far between in this area. We need to figure out what's here, when they're here, how many of them are here, so that if things do change, we can actually document that. We can say, these things used to be here, now they're starting to disappear. We've never seen these things here before, now they're starting to move in. So that's kind of a, the, the main tie-in to conservation is, if things are gonna change, we have to be able to definitively say, things are changing, they weren't here before. So there was a study done before, actually in this area, by USGS, and this was the report they put out. Um, they looked at the seasonal and spatial patterns, so they did a much bigger area than I've been able to do, and they did this over a two-year period, and they went out, and you can see the pictures on the front here, the nets they're using, so they went out, they used a beach seine, and they also did a trawl survey. So this was a, a really nice kind of baseline to work off of. Um, so the fish have been cataloged here in the past, but this really hasn't been done to a large scale since that sampling took place. Matt Kimball and his crew, when they were out, did a, the trawl survey, so the net drug behind the boat. That lasted a year, so there has been some fish work done, but it's kind of some big gaps in the information that's here. My goal was to try to fill in those gaps. So at the start, as I said, you know, we're the... College, Flagler College has been immensely helpful in getting this started. They've tried to make all things possible within reason. So I've asked for the moon and fell short sometimes, right? But they've been very helpful. Um, and they, they kind of said, you know, start your research project. Let us know what you need. So I figured if we wanted to try to get something we could easily do, let's just start with the beach sink. So I'd done this before. What you're seeing in the picture here is... Uh, an undergraduate on the right hand side, and then me with my expert opinion showing him, you know, how this should be done, right? The good thing is this does not have moving parts, right? So I can even show people how it's done. One end floats, one end sinks. So even if you're not really sure which end it is, you can put it in the water and figure it out, right? So very simple equipment, but I've used these in the past, they're really effective. We can tell kind of what's in that area if you're familiar with uh, downtown St. Augustine, that's Beach's restaurant in the background. So the way we started was we, my wife and I, on one Saturday, we drove around the intercoastal, so not a bad way to spend a Saturday, and we kind of went around and said, all right, where can we access the water? Where are we not going to be trespassing on private property? Where is there not a lot of obstructions? So we can get into the water and we can pull this sink. Um, the, the other good thing about this project is since Flagler does not have master students, or graduate students who go out and typically do the research, this project was simple enough that I could plug inter undergraduates interchangeably into this system. They didn't have to know anything about fish. I would teach them ID when we got out. Literally, if they could carry things, that was the only requirement. <laughs> and you'd be surprised how many of them jump at that opportunity, right? They love this undergraduate research experience. So 
we this is a, a map from a, a publication that we recently just got accepted. But what I did was we went around, we picked those sites. I tried to get sites that were downtown St. Augustine within the boundary of the GTM NUR. And this is actually missing two sites. We ended up dropping two sites. We went down as far as Washington Oaks Garden State Park, if you're familiar with that area. Those folks were nice enough to let us sample on their property. And we were also sampling uh, just south of the Matanzas Bridge at Summerhaven. We've ended up dropping that site just due to, to time constraints. So what we did is we originally started with 10 sites, and we didn't even have a vehicle, so I was throwing all this stuff into my personal vehicle, which my wife loved. Um, so we would put the nets in. I'd strap it to the top of the car if I was able to. We'd put the buckets in the back. We'd jump in my car, and we would just go. Typically, we would have two or three students along, and this is how this project kind of started. And I always, anytime I talk about this project, I'd be remiss if I did not mention the three original students. On the left is Charles Adams, in the middle is Austin O'Connor, and on the right is Annabella Panero. These three were the people who started this project with me. Um, I figured at the start I needed maybe a little bit more reliable group, so they did get credits for this. And they went out with me, established this project, and were out sampling. We went out to these 10 sites every single month, um, whether it was, you know, 106 degrees, which is 11 months out of the year in Florida. Um, believe it or not, there was one month where when we were up at the GTM property and using their mule, it was so cold my hand froze to the steering wheel. So we did have one month in the past four years where it was cold. So I do tell people when they're like, oh, it's Florida, it's not so bad. Well, yeah, exactly. So there was, there was one, you know, uncomfortable time we went out. Since that time, I've kind of recruited other students in. Um, I show this picture on the left. Uh, that's Madison Skidmore and Clay Van Kuyken. They absolutely love going out with me. They ask me when we're going out. They came up with this name. They call themselves McGinley's Minions, uh, which has now gone into t-shirts and a blog I do. And it was kind of a, an homage to them for being so willing, these guys come out, they beg me to go out, they remind me. Uh, when my daughter was born in November and I wasn't able to go out sampling, they took it upon themselves, they grabbed the net, they went, they did it so many times, they actually did the sampling for me. So the, the cool thing about the project is, you know, even if I'm not there, these students are still able to kind of get it. They've done the identification enough times that they know what they're looking at. And as I said, low tech, right? So we're out there. Um, I will say we have forgotten every single piece of equipment at some time or another, including the net, if you can believe that. <laughs> Luckily, we were at the GTM. They had a net we could use. Um, but we've forgotten buckets. I've used uh, the original cart we had. I filled that up with water and used that as a bucket. Um, we forgot measuring boards, so we ripped apart our notebook and kind of used that. So. Luckily, we're able to kind of make do when we're out there. We, you know, I tell my students this awful joke. If we did it right the first time, it would just be called search, but now we call it research, right? <laughs> so what we do is we go out, we catch these fish, we pull the net once, we take everything we catch, we put it into a bucket, and we put an aerator on that bucket, and then we go through, we identify everything we see, we measure everything we see, and then we keep everything in the bucket so that on that second pull, we're not catching the same organisms again. So we do two uh, pulls, removal sampling. Um, sometimes we get nothing. I think the most we've ever gotten was 5,000 fish in one seine pull. And I should say, the, to give you an idea, the seine net's 50 feet long and 4 foot tall. So we caught a school of bay anchovy. The good thing about that was so we caught 5,000, and we didn't count all of them. My student, it was just me and him, he was terrified. He was like, we got to count them all. <laughs> so we, we ended up, you know, filling the net a couple times, counted those, so we did an approximation. Well, the next poll we did, we caught another 5,000. So sometimes, you know, you're the bug, sometimes you're the windshield, right? So we, it, it's still really cool because we're getting a lot of information. We're getting a lot of fish. We test water quality when we're out. Um, I'll talk about how that fits in a little bit later, but we're using uh, salinity, temperature, dissolved oxygen to... Uh, kind of mark where those fish are at. Are there any preferences for those water quality variables where they're at? So some of the things we've seen, 
Um, we catch game fish. So I've only ever seen one snook, and it was actually at the GTM NUR at their dam when I was helping uh, do seining for another group. We caught flounder. We've caught red drum. Um, typically, when people see us out, they ask us, you know, are you catching fish, taking them home and eating? And all of the times we've done this, we've caught, I think, one regulation fish. So that's in four years, 10, 10 sites, you know, 12 months a year. So I don't recommend this as, you know, your method for going out and catching dinner. Um, people do use these if they're longer. People use 100-foot seines. Um, there are regulations as to the size of the, the seine you're allowed to use. And the other interesting thing is, so you always hear estuaries are nurseries, right? These are where fish go to have their young. It's protected. There's a lot of food available for them. And that's bearing out in our sampling. We have red drum in the top left. We have uh, unidentified yet snapper that we caught. Bottom left is a relative of the red drum. These are spot. Bottom right, I thought this was cool at the one site. We caught permit and pompano, so I can kind of show people the difference between these two. Um, but we're seeing this bear out. We're seeing that this is indeed a nursery area. So total, and I, I really kind of like stressing these numbers. I don't know, maybe it just makes me feel good, right? To date, we've caught 55,453 different things. Um, I do include blue crab and lesser blue crab in these numbers, and these are fish. These are uh, the squid you see there. It's the Atlantic Brief Squid. We've caught a handful of those, not, not necessarily a ton of them. All different types of fish. And that 90 species number you see there is actually probably an underestimate. There are different groups of fish. Um, if you're familiar, uh, there's a fish called mohara. They're silver. That's our identifying characteristic. They're silver. There's at least four to five species we have here. And when they're little, what you have to do, and someone told me this, and I still don't believe it, you pull the jaw down to see if there's scales around a patch between the eyes. And if it's completely uh, scaled around that patch, it's one species. If it's half, it's another species. I still have yet to actually see this. So those are kind of lumped together into one group. So that 90 species that we've caught so far is probably an underestimate. Um, going forward, Dr. Saran, who's also a professor at Flagler, is interested in doing DNA barcoding. So the things that we can't really identify in the field, we take a sample. And we're working on doing just a, a clip of their fin not a fatal sampling. She runs DNA, and then we can say definitively what species we have here. So we're in the very early stages of kind of um, documenting it in a DNA barcoding aspect. The fish, what's that? No, that's, that's kind of the, tech, or the, the terminology, right? So DNA barcoding. So what they can do is they can run the information, look at their DNA, and then um, that's geneticist terminology, right? So you can say definitively this was a you know, uh, Tidewater Mahara or whatever it may be. So they can actually, even if I can't do it in the field, they can do it just based on a little bit of their fin. Picture you see in the upper right, this fish blew me away. This is a juvenile look down. You'll see these guys, they're pretty popular aquarium fish, um, you know, larger scale aquarium. I had a student send me a picture the other day and say, I found a purple fish that has really long fins. What is it? And I get these emails all the time, right? I get kind of a blurry picture and people are like, what is it? And I'm like, that's a great question. <laughs> Send me a better picture. But um, if you've ever heard of African pompano, those have the same type of fins, but they're really beautiful. They're purple, really, really long fins. I haven't had a chance, and they taste good too, right? I haven't had a chance to look these up, but someone was saying, I don't know if this is an urban legend, they take their fins and kind of smack prey with it and then stun them and kind of direct it towards the mouth. That might be one of those old urban legends. I don't know if that's true, but we see kind of a lot of different a uh, lot of different species out there. To date, we've done this for 40 months. My goal is to keep this going until I retire from Flagler. So my goal is to make this an extremely long-term data set on the order of decades if we can keep it going. Or 100 months, right? 400 months, yeah, keep it going. So what are some of the things we've learned? What are some of the, the tie-ins to conservation here? Well, one... We did know that there were invasive species here. Um, and I should say that there is a difference. Um, I have non-native up there. Non-native means they're here. They're not supposed to be here. 
we haven't really documented a big effect on native populations yet. Invasive means these things are really wreaking havoc. You guys are all familiar with lionfish. Um, I have heard anecdotal reports that lionfish are here in the intercoastal. They're definitely off the coast of Jacksonville. We have students doing a diet study with lionfish caught off the coast of Jacksonville to see what they're eating. Um, but we do have in the top right, this is a non-native species. This is the Indo-Pacific swimming crab. If you're familiar with your geography, we're not in the Indo-Pacific, so we know these guys aren't supposed to be here. They think that these are ballast water introductions, and we get a lot of introductions that way, where container ships are loaded to capacity here. They go over to Asian countries. They offload their cargo. If they're not bringing anything back, the ship wouldn't sit in the water correctly, so they take on water from the Indo-Pacific. Not only are they taking in water, but they're taking in organisms that live in the water. They come back. They don't need that water anymore, so they discharge the water here and load up with containers. And what we're finding is this is a huge source of introductions of non-native invasive species. They think that's how the Indo-Pacific swimming crab got here, was ballast water introduction. That individual was found at the St. Augustine Municipal Marina. They love structure. You don't typically find these out on sand flats where we've done some of our other sampling. We're working on other projects with these guys, and I'll show you those in a second. Um, the picture on the bottom left there is a nine-armed sea star. This is a, a just kind of crazy story as to how science works. So we went out sampling. I've started to partner with Dr. Brown at uh, Flagler College as well. He does plankton sampling. So you go out and you take a little net, really small mesh. He drags it in the water and then looks under the microscope at what's there. Well, we were sitting in the parking lot in front of the Castillo de San Marcos, and it was raining, and Clay and I said, do we want to sample? Are we feeling kind of lazy? And he said, no, let's do it. So he convinced me, and we go out, and he pulls the, the plankton net. Dr. Brown gets about 500 mils of water from that. He then looks at a very small percentage, maybe 1% of that. He found this, then went to Dr. Saran and said, I don't know what that is. And she said, it looks weird. Let's, let's talk to Dr. McGinley. Turns out this shouldn't be here. This is actually a species that's more found near Brazil, nine-armed nine sea star. This is the farthest north that's ever been documented, probably by chance, right? But we don't know if they're moving up. So we were able to take a picture. That's a picture with an iPhone. So you kind of do with you, what you got, right? So Dr. Brown took the picture. We wrote it up. We sent it off. So we actually got that published that this is the farthest north this species has ever been located. Completely and utterly by chance, did we actually find this thing, but sometimes you get lucky, right? So some other things we've learned, and this is not um, necessarily groundbreaking information. What we found as we do our sampling, average tax of richness just tells us, you know, how many species are we catching each month when we average them all together. You can see that as you get into colder months, we don't see as many species. This is a pretty normal pattern in estuaries you get a seasonal shift in the community. We now can document that, and this has been shown with that paper I showed you earlier by USGS, is we definitely have a temperature kind of dependent system here. One thing about our intercoastal waterway is we do have freshwater inputs, but they're not as dramatic as you would see in something like the Chesapeake Bay. So I looked at some of the data from the GTM NER, the stations they have out. I went back to 2002 and looked at 800, I think it was 400,000 time intervals. And I think out of that time, roughly 13% of the time, and it measures every 15 minutes, it was below 30 parts per thousand. So this system is a fairly salty system. We don't have a massive freshwater input in the main part of the intercoastal. In some of these areas like Pellicer Creek, that salinity will go down a lot lower. The other interesting thing we've, we've been able to document is we can look at specific organisms, specific species. The one you see here is that spot. I showed you the, the picture of the juvenile earlier. We can pretty definitively say for some of these species when they're coming in and when we're actually seeing them. The catch per unit effort is just uh, how many roughly per seine pole we're getting. What we find and those big spikes are not big adult fish. They're fish that are about 15 millimeters long. When we're out in these winter months, we're getting 1,500, 2,000 of these per seine pole. 
So the spot are breeding in the colder months. We're seeing these numbers. It's kind of, uh, it's fun for me. I joke around that I get to see them grow up because if you look at the size of these guys in the winter months, they're very small, 15 millimeters. As the water gets warmer and time goes on, you can actually see the fish get bigger. You can see the, the number you're catching get smaller because the old joke in fishery science is the average fish is dead. So they have 10,000 offspring and maybe a fraction of 1% of those survive. So we're seeing massive numbers of the young, but as they get bigger, only a small kind of subset of those are actually getting bigger. So we can document and say, when are these things breeding? Where are they breeding? How many are we seeing? Is there differences in the strength of the year class? So do we get more in certain times of the year? Fish kind of go through this boom and bust cycle. Some years there's a lot and some years there's not as many. So we can kind of document that cycle and see if anything's kind of getting amiss with how they should be, uh, how they should be reproducing. So kind of going forward, um, I was talking with, uh, with some of you guys before we got started here that when I go out, essentially I come back with more questions than I started with, which is good, right? That's how, that's how science should work. So other projects that we are currently starting or have recently started, uh, marinas as habitats. There is some literature out, out there that say, yes, anthropogenic influences, human impacts, definitely bad, right? We're building on beaches, we're getting rid of sea turtle habitat, um, we're adding plastics to the water, whatever it may be. But there's also some literature that says things like marinas are wonderful habitats. You're giving all these things uh, spaces to attach and grow. This was about uh, two or three weeks ago when we had that big storm where all the sargassum blew in. Down at the St. Augustine Municipal Marina, we went down just on a hunch and started looking what was there. We're finding species on the sargassum in the upper right is a sargassum crab. Whoever started naming things in sargassum was very original. You have sargassum crab, sargassum fish, sargassum nudibranch. Um, so they kind of went with what they knew, right? Not only the sargassum there, it kind of is part of this project, but we also set out fish habitat baskets, which are just cylinders that have one inch openings and we're seeing what colonizes that. We're finding that Indo-Pacific swimming crab at the St. Augustine Marina loves those habitat baskets. I have a student doing a mark recapture project to try to figure out how many are there. Um, what is the status of the population? Eventually I'd like to move out to more marinas. Right now we're just focusing on St. Augustine Municipal Marina. I also joked that when we were down there, I caught a unicorn. The fish on the left there is called a unicorn file fish. I don't tell people the file fish part, right? I just tell them I caught a unicorn. Um, these are fish, and on the right is a plainhead file fish. So these are fish that are associated with sargassum or some type of cover. So we're looking to see what's using that area. I have another student that I just built a, a big PVC net. And she's going to go down to the marina and sweep the water and see what juvenile fish are using that marina as protection. The picture in the middle on the bottom is, this just blows me away. This is a tuna kit. So this is an animal. It doesn't really look like an animal, right? It's just a purple blob. One of the things we're finding on these fish habitat baskets are these tuna kits. So what happens is these have free swimming larvae. So they have offspring. They'll swim through the water. They'll find a place to kind of set down. This is the part I love. Then they eat their own brain. So they don't need the nervous system anymore. They're basically going to be filter feeders after that. So they kind of get rid of the, the neural material. And then they're just going to filter feed. These comes in all kinds of shapes, sizes, and colors. We've seen reds and oranges. Um, so just fascinating, fascinating diversity on these traps. So we're seeing, so those are tunicates. Um, some people call them sea squirts as well, if you've ever heard that terminology. Absolutely. So these guys are in phylum chordata, and so are humans. So we have four characteristics in common with those, even though it doesn't really look like it, right? So absolutely, they are some of our early ancestors, early predecessors. So the other project I'm working on, Dr. Brown there is in the bottom right out taking, it looks like he's not really doing anything, maybe standing in the water. He's doing water quality. Um, what we're doing is we're trying to figure out not only where the fish are, so that's kind of how this project started, 
but why are they there? So we're working on measuring different things in the water, the temperature, the salinity, the nutrients available for plankton, which then feeds the fish. We're looking at minutes after sunrise, so it doesn't matter what time of day we go out. It doesn't matter the tide we go out. We put all this into a computer and it kind of spits out the output. What we're finding is temperature is important, but it's not the only thing. And a lot of the things we've measured aren't actually what's driving these communities. Maddening when you kind of, you, you've done this for a year, or two years, and you've collected all this data and then find out that's not what you should have been collecting, right? But that's how science works, and it's a learning experience. Now we know going forward, um, these are things that are going to be important. So the really key take-home message in this is temperature is really important for driving this. As that temperature starts to change, we're going to see changes associated with that. So temperature absolutely is going to play a part, still does. Um, it's just going to be how does that offset the system we're actually seeing. Correct. Correct. But as you see uh, air temperature increase, you're going to see water temperature increase as well. I don't know the off the top of my head the direct kind of factor you're looking at, but yeah, as air temperature increases, you'll see a, an increase in the water temperature as well. So, and we, we can look, even small changes in that temperature could possibly have some big consequences. And that's one of the things we need to figure out is what kind of threshold are we looking at for that change in water temperature? Absolutely. And that's, we're, we're already seeing those sorts of things. Um, one of the prime examples in the North Sea, which is a huge fishery, um, we're seeing fish communities are moving farther north because the water temperature is increasing. So the fishing fleets have to kind of follow them north. So we are seeing fish migrate to areas where they haven't been in the past because water temperature change. That, and that's absolutely correct. Now the big question becomes, will it take the place of something you lost? Will it have negative consequences? So it, it very well could kind of step in. You won't see a negative consequence. You won't see the community crash, but we don't know those things, right? It will. Yeah, and it's and that's why what we're finding is probably not as simple as going out and measuring it once when we're out there. You're absolutely right. The good thing about our system, it's shallow enough. Um, most parts, de depth we're looking at is 20 feet. So we're not seeing these huge changes in temperature from top to bottom. But yeah, you look at a deeper system, you're absolutely going to see a vertical profile in that temperature. I will, yes. I, I'll invite you guys back once we hit 400 months and, you know, maybe then we'll be like, well, it turns out all that stuff we measured still wasn't the right thing. Um, and that's what you find in science, right? You kind of move forward. Yep. Yeah, and that's why people who are much smarter than I build those really complicated kind of large-scale models. Um, as uh, Kenneth kind of said at the beginning, when we look at conservation, we're looking for this project local levels, but we can't separate that out from uh, global kind of trends, the different uh, changes we're going to see on that level. So one of the other projects uh, that we're working on is and Mike is actually here today. He was uh, this was kind of really fortuitous. He came to our capstone presentations, our student research presentations, and said, "You know, I have a sailboat." And I said, "Great. When can we get on it?" Um, and actually, you know, he he offered. He said, "Look, we're going to do these different samplings. We want to get you guys involved." And that's Mike on the the right there on the sailboat on Sea Breeze. And because of this, I ordered what's called a Newston net. That's the net you see on the left hand side here. This net is a very big net, as Mike can attest to. This net goes two meters by one meter. So this is a six and a half foot net by three foot net. Um, when we were out, one, I found out that I should not be on a sailboat, that I need to kind of maybe keep myself to the intercoastal and not off coast. Um, I'm 0 for 2 on that regard now. But we went out and we were trying to catch all these fish. We we're trying to, you know, maybe get some sargassum and see what fish are off the coast, you know, what things are coming into the intercoastal looking at uh, maybe trying to get an idea of who's coming in to breed or are things getting transported into the intercoastal to kind of grow up. We didn't catch a single fish. And kind of looking at it, we were like, well, 
you know, let's take the water back and see what we get. What you see in the middle there is another animal. This is called a salp. These guys are really interesting, and I had no idea about these organisms before we went out. These are uh, gelatinous animals, so they're kind of like a jellyfish, but they don't sting. This one here is a uh, solitary organism, and these things can be colonies as well. They can get fairly long. The string that you see inside with what looks like little discs are the offspring that it's basically going to kind of output. So we found a whole bunch of gelatinous zooplankton, and now I'm, you know, my mind's racing, and I'm thinking, all right, what project can Mike and I start, and how often can we go out, and will we ever catch a fish? Um, but these are, you know, kind of other projects, and uh, we've been talking about how we'd like to kind of keep this going. And one of the the other big things I want to talk about. This is kind of twofold. Uh, before this presentation started today, Kenneth and I were talking. We've been trying to get a another trawl survey going, trying to replicate what Matt Kimball was able to do. Um, my daughter does not want me to do this. She's 10 months old. The two times we tried to go out, she's gotten sick. Uh, once with a fever and once uh, she was throwing up. So we're going to get out and we're going to start this project again. Uh, and this is kind of to, to really complete that picture. We have the near shore community, but we can only get you know, depending on the, the water height, about 50 feet from the beach. Most times, that's only about three feet of water. If we want to try to get those deeper species, those bigger fish, we need to run the trawl net. And you can see the picture in the bottom right there. It's the green net. This is called an otter trawl. So it has two doors, a chain on the bottom that drags the net on the bottom. This net opens up, and anything that kind of gets caught in front of the net gets pushed into the back. Um, we we are permitted to do all of this, so the goal is to try to start this. Um, we've talked, I think we've finally nailed down a date. But going along with this, I want to actually revamp the SANE study that we've been doing. The great thing about doing it is we can get out, but unless we randomize kind of where we're sampling, it's very difficult to tell people this is the population of the fish we're seeing. So going forward, I want to kind of change that around a little bit, change where we're going. Once we get maybe a, a small boat, we can get in, get on both sides, not just places we can access by car. Um, and that'll give us even more information. So not only what's here, but how many, what's the density, what is the population size. And then we can start looking at, you know, are there uh, decreases in the population? Should that be something we're worried about? Do we not see certain fish using this as a nursery anymore? So going forward, that could possibly inform decisions about how to manage this system. So with that, um, I'll just explain this picture really quick, and then I'll, I'll take any questions that you guys might have. So this is what's called a snapping shrimp. So the claw, you can kind of see it on his right claw is an enlarged claw. These hurt. So, and I, I'm taking this from my student's word. He actually pulled the net up. So that's a close-up of the, the same net. And he heard this kind of snapping sound. And he looked down, and he saw the shrimp, and he picked it up, and it snapped on his finger. So the snapping shrimp name is very appropriate, right? Um, but this just goes to show, I mean, we, you know, we were pretty much done sampling, and we were still finding cool stuff. Um, the, I think the, the last thing I'll finish up with, probably the best part of all this, besides hanging out in a beautiful area, getting out and seeing cool things, it's great for me. I've done this. The best part for me is taking my students out, students who have never done this before, and seeing kind of just, you know, their eyes light up being in areas that they've been a hundred times before, but never really looking at what's there, seeing what's there. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions you guys might have. Yes, sir. Did you find any mantis shrimp at all? So the question was, did we find any mantis shrimp? And we found one, and that was at um, the Volano site in front of the yeah, and the, the one we saw, I'm trying to think of the, the length. It was about six inches. Um, I tried to figure out the species. I, I wasn't able to. But, yeah, we found just the one mantis shrimp. And I'd heard from other people that, indeed, there are mantis shrimp. Um, I knew what it was, so I knew not to pick it up. If you guys aren't familiar, yeah, these guys, the way they work is they basically have a pistol-loaded claw that it, it fires so fast that they don't kill by actually hitting with the, the claw. 
what they do is they create pressure bubbles in the water, which when they burst, explode clamshells. And they've been known to break uh, aquarium glass because they can fire so hard. <laughs> so I, I guess it's that, that's kind of I got to get a more information. Do they want to come out so they can go fishing? Um, but to to answer the the question in all seriousness, um, I've I've kind of wrestled with this whether opening this up beyond just undergraduate. Uh, uh, volunteers, liability issues. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more with my department chair. I would love to get community volunteers involved in this project. Um, I've done this. I'm starting to work on a community partnership with St. Joseph's Academy to get uh, Chris Williams marine biology students out to do the seining. Um, my wife teaches at Pedro Menendez High School. I'm trying to work with them to get their high school students out. So I will um, work on that aspect of getting community volunteers, but I would love if we could make that happen. I think it would be a, an incredibly worthwhile endeavor. Sure. Sure. Um, the question was, you know, we were able to identify when we're out there, how do we learn scientific names associated with these and really keep them straight? Um, practice. <laughs> the, and the one thing I'll, I'll tell you is my advisor, um, he, he kind of, we had this conversation too, is, you know, are we pronouncing it right? And he said, well, Latin's a dead language. No one's going to know if you're pronouncing it right or wrong, right? But it's just, it really is. It's just practice. I still struggle with a lot of them. Um, my students uh, struggle with a lot of them, but what we try to do is we try to work on these. We just, when we see it, um, we often write down common name, but you know, when I'm with them, I'll tell them what the scientific name is. So for me, it's just repetition, seeing these guys over and over and over. A lot of times if I, like the unicorn filefish, I couldn't tell you the scientific name off the top of my head. Um, I know it's in the genus, I think, Eluterus, but it's, it's really just working at it um, and knowing you're never going to get it down. So the the question is, do we have Latin? And this would be, I know we have taught it in the past. I don't know how regular it is offered at Flagler College, but it would be kind of a great resource to include. Um, I think it's just availability of people who are able to teach it. Um, the more popular languages tend to be, at least at Flagler, are German, Russian, and Spanish, just because we have those professors. But it absolutely would be worthwhile to check into because it would be a great resource. Yeah, I uh, I don't even try to mess with the plankton names. I leave that to Dr. Brand. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Uh, the question is, the 9 arm sea star we showed, was that a, a magnified image? That was under the microscope, and I'm trying to remember, I believe that was 100 times magnification. Um, so he took it through the microscope, so that what you're looking at was indeed a larval 9 arm sea star, uh, which I believe the scientific name, uh, now you're putting me on the spot, Luidia Seneg senegalensis. Yes, sir. Shrimp, minor shrimp man, they keep saying and what was the, the second term you used? Shrimp mammy versus mantis shrimp. I'm not sure of those. Is it? So the, it has been verified by someone who knows more about it than I that uh, you definitely, uh, when you talk about shrimp mammy versus mantis shrimp, are kind of the same term. <laughs> um, as far as I know, uh, and actually I'm, I'm not even going to say I don't know off the top of my head about, about the, and I know we have a couple of them here, 
So there could be some that are protected. So I'd, I'd have to look into that for you. Yes, sir. So the, the question was, do we find any other fish we find here that we normally find offshore besides the look down? Um, Permit and Pompano, once those guys get bigger, they'll head offshore. Um, trying to think of some of these others. Some of the flounder may be resident, but some of those guys might head out off to the, the coastal shelf. Mangrove snapper, yeah, a lot of these snappers. Um, we did not find too many in the way of grunts, which would do the same thing. Um, I'd have to go back, and it, it's a really good question as to who is coming in and using this as a nursery area, moving offshore. We definitely, I will guarantee that besides the look down, we have caught others. Um, and it, it's given me a good idea as to maybe look into the proportion that are using this as, as nursery. Yeah, and I... The the other the the uh, comment was that look down our reef fish. The the thing I'm finding out too is I need to learn more about life histories of these guys. So I know some the some that we see more often, and I've worked with a lot more. And I I am pretty ignorant, I should say, when it comes to some of these life histories of these guys. So that's kind of my next step, right? So look down migrate through here in the spring and in the fall in the intercoastal and juvenile. Okay, so the, the comment, again, I'm, luckily uh, Dan is here to kind of help me out. Uh, juveniles do migrate in spring and fall through the intercoastal. So we do have, um, you know, the, the transient species in here. Did you have a question? Sure. The question was, are we testing water quality and what's the status of the system? Is it a good system? Is the water quality within range? Um, from what we've seen, and it's always difficult because we, when we go out, we're getting snapshots of just that time frame. What we've seen is the dissolved oxygen for the most part, that's really going to be a good indicator. We haven't really seen too much in the way of DO stress. And I, I can only kind of talk very topically on that for us. The folks at the GTM might be able to tell you more. Um, because our system is so tidally influenced, this massive amount of flushing, and talking with Dr. Brown, we don't see a lot of the in the way of algal blooms here because there's not enough resonance time for that nutrients to cause algal blooms, which would cause some of the detrimental effects. So that, you know, we've all seen it, the guacamole water a little bit south of here. We typically don't see that because our system's a little bit more open, more water flow. Um, one of the things that uh, Maya McGuire through Florida Sea Grant and then some of the students and GTM is working on are microplastics in the water. So we are seeing microplastics in the water. We are having a couple different avenues of those getting in. Uh, so microplastics are just, these would be microscopic plastics. Research has shown that sometimes chemicals are attached to these can have detrimental effects on fish, on fish health, fish reproduction, fish development. Um, so in regards to, and I always kind of get on my students when they say, what's the health of the system? It kind of depends how you're looking at it, right? Water quality wise, it seems like it is a, you know, a fairly consistent, fairly good system, but there are anthropogenic influences on that system. So nothing is pristine. And uh, the comment uh, Taryn made was that Maya McGuire will be here in December to give the lecture on uh, microplastics. And she, if you do have a chance to come, she's phenomenal. She's come to talk to our students. The work she's doing is just, is incredible. That's correct, yep. We do this, um, so we sample each site once a month. So um, during the summer, you can usually do this in about two days. During the school year, it's usually taking uh, probably three days, depending on class schedules. Uh, in this system, no. I would I would say as of yet, we have not seen impacts. Um, and I asked the group, um, and again, the question was, are there are we seeing impacts from lionfish? Um, I asked the group that was studying lionfish, you know, are lionfish visual predators? And that's going to be a really important 
um, constraint because our water here is really turbid, really productive. So it's very low visibility. So the question becomes, can lionfish thrive in this site when they're used to a reef system where they have good visibility, they can see the prey? Um, so that would be a question I'd need to kind of answer beforehand. Okay? How would, um, yes. Um, so they can come on a net. Probably the easiest way to get a hold of me, and I, I thought about this on the way down, that I didn't include my email or bring business cards. So completely unprepared, I do apologize. Um, but you can get a hold of me at my email, which is emcginley at flagler.edu. I'm happy to answer any questions you guys might have that you think of kind of after this talk. Um, at the very you know least, you could uh, get a hold of Kenneth or folks at the GTM who can get you in contact with me. But again, it's emcginley at flagler.edu. Is there much Sure. The the question is, you know, is there similar projects going on in St. John's River, other areas? And the answer is yes. What we're finding is this area, for some reason, the intercoastal right here in St. Augustine down to Marine Land, uh, Ponte Vedra, is kind of this uh, this weird blank space. So Fish and Wildlife has a group called uh, the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute. I believe I might have gotten that acronym wrong. But they are based out of Jacksonville University and they sample a lot in the St. John's River. I talked to the, the gentleman in charge, Russ Brody, and he said, you know, down south of where we're at in Flagler County and south, uh, and south being south of Flagler College, there are surveys going on. St. John's River, there are surveys going on. But for some reason, this spot here they don't hit a lot. So I'm trying to work with them to standardize our sampling methods so that we can compare what they're getting in their areas to what we're getting to folks that are south of us. The only problem, you, or one of the big problems you see in science is a lot of times, you know, we're very kind of solitary creatures. We like to do our project. We have our, our idea. We do it. And then we find out, well, the person, you know, to the north of us is doing it just a little bit different. Now we can't directly compare. So that's one of the things we need to work on is standardizing gear types so we can then take what we're finding, compare it to theirs, and make a much more complete picture. You mentioned that Florida has other different species uh, of fish. How does that compare roughly, say, Chesapeake, California, Alaska? I mean, is it, I mean it's probably more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the question is, um, and that 300 number is just in our intercoastal waterway here. So Florida in general is going to have much more than that. Um, so the question is, how does our intercoastal waterway compare with some of these other areas? Um, off the top of my head, I can tell you it's it's actually fairly similar in the number of species with the Chesapeake Bay. As for the number of residents versus migrants, that you know I'm a little bit more foggy on, but it does compare with something like the Chesapeake Bay. When you look to different areas of Texas, um, some it kind of is is very locally dependent. Some of those estuaries will have kind of a dearth of species. Some will have more. Um, it just so happens that you know our system here, we have this ecotone of we get fish that are at the southern end of their northern range. We get fish that are at the northern end of their southern range. We get fish that are found here. We get hybrid hybridization happening. So it's kind of a, a unique system, um, but does compare favorably when you're looking at number of species here versus some of these other spots. And uh, the sure the the question was can uh, weather patterns lead to some of these introductions? Uh, lead to some of the species you're seeing and absolutely and the, the big question then becomes if you're looking at say a storm situation you might get only a handful one or two maybe not enough to actually establish a population so what you would need to have happen is and this is kind of really going general on this idea is not only would a storm be able to bring it here but the area it's going to is now favorable for it to kind of survive so 
even though they're getting brought up here, maybe the system isn't favorable enough yet. Maybe the water temperatures aren't warm enough or they're warm enough now, but they get too cold in the winter months. So it would almost have to be a combination of favorable habitat. And you're absolutely right. We see sargassum coming in. We see um, species from down south kind of getting moved up. So weather will transport these guys. It's just a matter of can the system support them at that time. And the question is, uh, the this area of northeast Florida and Georgia, we see a lot of paper mills, a lot of um, kind of discharge going into the water. So what effect does that have on water? Now, it depends kind of how you frame the question, water clarity versus water quality. Sure. Um, my, my hypothesis, and not, you know, having tested this, it's kind of hard to say definitively, that the water clarity issue is not necessarily from effluent. What we're seeing is productivity and a lot of water movement kind of stirring up the sediments so you get kind of more turbid water. So what you're seeing is that's happening here. As you move south, water gets clear. Um, I'd have to bring my oceanographer colleague in to talk about why, you know, you hit that point of turbid versus non-turbid. In terms of the water quality, very topically, we haven't seen necessarily a direct impact from that. That does not mean that there is not impacts happening. It just means that we are not measuring whatever it is that might be affecting at this time. Um, and I, I'm almost positive there would be literature out there on what those impacts might be, what the chemicals are in, uh, that effluent coming out, how those would directly impact, say, fish or corals or invertebrates um, that you see like uh, things like, you know, marine worms. I, I'm sure that literature is out there. Unfortunately, not having looked into it, I couldn't necessarily comment on it. So the yeah, the question is, will Jacksonville or St. Augustine see an aquarium? My understanding is St. Augustine Aquarium is under construction on State Road 16. Supposedly, I don't know what stage they're at. I know ground has been broken. I don't know if they're still continuing. Um, the and they actually had met with us to talk about education programs. So I'm not sure the stage they're in. Jacksonville has talked about it for a long time. They wanted to put it out there uh, near the landing or the shipyards. Um, they at one spark a year or two ago they did get a good amount of funding. I'm not sure where they're at in their kind of stage of planning. But yeah, the uh, you know, people love seeing that sort of stuff. Um, you know, I, I'm chomping at the bit to see what Marine Land has here. So it'd be a wonderful, wonderful education resource. Um, just a lot of hoops to jump through. I actually probably need to get back and teach class now. <laughs> yep. We have. Um, so the question was, have we ever sampled the sediments? Um, there are uh, inverts, marine worms that live in there. We see small uh, bivalves, things like clams. Um, surprisingly, though, you don't see a ton of stuff in the sediments. There is stuff there um, compared to some other areas that have a lot more kind of sediment organisms. So there are some stuff there. Another kind of on the list project is to sample that sediment and see what is in the sediments there. It is, yeah. You look, anytime you're out